on a bigger level, or maybe even it's a more mundane level, um, it's about what is it to live in a society where we don't really experience, you know, history or the future, or we don't have uh, uh, a sense of origins or destiny, where we don't have, you know, goals to drive ourselves forward. So, well, on a certain level, um, the now I'm talking about is this assault that we might want to defend ourselves from. On the other hand, being in the now is a great relief from you know some pretty old uh, and stultifying narratives, and uh, something at at its very best, it's a liberation from the uh, kind of. Uh, industrial age exploitative models by which you know we've lived for the past uh, gosh the past thousand years so it's sort of both you know I, I I think of it in terms of defense when I think of you know digital technologies and how do you unplug to a certain extent how do you take authority over your various digital identities so they're not doing things without you how do you uh, recognize that you know, what's going on uh, and often what's upsetting you is not some piece of technology. You know, it's not your email program that's the problem. It's the other people on the other side of the emails who are the problem and the, the, the you know, tremendous expectations they have on you to respond in what they consider to be a, a timely fashion. You know, so, you know, there's a, there, there, is, there is that. So in, in Present Shock, the book, you know, I look at... Uh, really, how uh, how we've been really fighting this kind of age old battle between uh, you know what the Greeks would call Chronos or clock time, and what they'd call Kairos or timing. You know, it's like the timing is the trickier one for people to get. They know what Chronos is. It's you know four twenty two on the clock. That's Chronos. But what's Kairos? Kairos is like timing. It's like opportunity and readiness. You know, what's the best time to tell Dad you crashed the car? You know, is it 501? No. You know, it's after he's, after he's had his drink, but before he's opened the bills, right? It's <laughs> a, sense of, a sense of timing. And I look at human beings as, as uh, um, at our healthiest, at our best as a culture, we're, we're clued in to timing. We're clued into that kind of, uh, you know, wave-like variation in, in culture and personally and in relationships. And we know how to ride that stuff. And um, the better you ride it, the more aware you are of it, whether it's day and night or cycles of the moon or cycles of your wife or whatever it is, um, you know, the, the more coherent you are from day to day. Uh, the temptation with digital technology in particular is to think of time as generic, you know, where the, where the analog clock broke up, you know, it broke up the day into work units. At least it was related to the day. You know, it was, you look at that pie chart and it's like, okay, here's 12 uh, or 24 divisions of, of my day. You know, digital time is just a number. It's not, you know, a minute is no longer some segment of an hour. A minute is this absolute duration. Um, so that's kind of the digital media environment that I'm writing about is this one that's that's kind of absolute and in the present and sort of always on. And there are these two presents. You know, there's this real present that's this sort of kairos I'm talking about, the real present of me and you talking even through this digital technology, at least where where it's a live interaction. Um, and then the faux present of all the various pings of our devices, the the algorithms of our stock market, you know, the... the uh, um, connections that we try to draw between things because we don't really have stories to understand them. And even the the false, you know, sort of impending doom of the, and I write about this in the book, the kind of the zombie apocalypse fantasy uh, is also to me is just an escape from the here and now that we're actually in. We can more easily imagine a zombie apocalypse than we can imagine going on like this any longer, just sustaining ourselves somehow through the coming chaos. Hmm. You mentioned the phases of the moon, and there was an interesting part where, uh, and I went to that website, Dr. Mark Philippi, mm -hmm. somaspace.org. It, it, you thought that you'd actually increase your productivity about 40% by following 
the phases of the moon and the different kinds of energy that they uh, result in. Are you, are you still using that method? Yeah, I mean, and it, it's funny because on the surface it sounds really new agey. Once you hear the moon, you're like, ooh. Um, but then when you realize, you know, the moon uh, affects tides in a very real way. You know, it's 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 not just the you know the the check-ins at Bellevue that go up at the full moon. It's you know you could you could uh, measure a whole lot by the moon and a whole lot of plants and a whole lot of little animals. So. Um, it shouldn't be surprising that humans, not just women, but men and women, both have a, a lunar cycle. And the one that they've um, that they're that they're sort of figuring out now has to do with the shifting neurochemicals. That you're, you're sort of the dominant neurotransmitter in your in your brain um, is it changes on each week of the lunar cycle. So you have a week of uh, of kind of increased acetylcholine and a week of increased serotonin, then a week of increased dopamine, and then a week of increased norepinephrine in the first, second, third, and fourth phase of the moon. It's like, well, what does that mean? Well, acetylcholine is a very specific neurotransmitter. When, when you're kind of high on, neuro, on, on acetylcholine, it's really good for starting things and meeting people. You're kind of happy and peppy. When you're getting into serotonin week, you're getting really good at working and focusing and getting stuff done. When you flip into a dopamine week, then it's, you know, go skiing, go on a roller coaster, you know, party, do drugs, do whatever it is you do. You know, that's the sort of uh, uh, party self-destructive kind of urge. And then the last week, the norepinephrine is when everybody kind of gets like, uh, you know, Barack Obama, they become really analytical and kind of non-emotional. It's when you move into a fight or flight kind of, uh, 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 you know, overarching uh, 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 systematic kind of structural view of things. So just knowing that to say, okay, I'm in dopamine week. I'm not going to try to push out more pages this week. You know, so serotonin week's coming up. I'm going to get some writing done. I'm going to write 10, 12 articles and I'm just going to bang them out. Acetylcholine week, the week before that, is when I'm going to listen to other people. I'm most open to new ideas. So I'm listening to people, listening to ideas and jotting them down. So then in the next serotonin week, I can start really um, I'm using those ideas in my pieces, right? That's, I'm not as open in that week, but I'm very self-expressive. Then after that crazy week, push myself to the end of it, then have a dopamine week, then relax, <laughs> play with my daughter, do more Legos, take my wife out to lunch. Everybody's sort of more into relaxing and all. And then take that last week and be kind of structural. Look at the structure of my book, the structure of my life. Look at my um, uh, stock portfolio, you know, <laughs> things like that where I can be cold and sort of analytical. And um, by doing that, yeah, my uh, certainly my uh, – and it's funny. I wrote less days per month, but my words per month went way up. That was the 40% that I used. You know, my 40% per month went up. Um, my feeling of writer's block, although I don't really agree with the term, my sense of writer's block, the, the times when I sat down to write and had nothing to say or had no way of doing it, those were gone because I was only writing during that super productive get something written week. It was like this, you know, screaming uh, uh, marathon. So, yeah, and that's, you know, that's super simple. And that's a really easy thing to keep track of now in a, in a digital age. And it's one that it's the kind of self-timing and the kind of um, uh, self-driven schedule that I thought at the beginning that was the promise of the digital age. Here we were. We were going to remember we were going to write in our underwear from our homes and do what we wanted and, and, and slack. And then, you know, it, it slowly but surely turned into this kind of poster child for the NASDAQ stock exchange, this way of, you know, monitoring people's employees, making sure instead of us working in our own time, we're always on all the time in real time, constant availability, which is the opposite, right? So we end up instead of being smarter online because we've gone offline to write stuff and then post it, we're stupid online because we're trying to keep up with things in the moment. Oh, there's this post 829, I got a post by 831, or the Twitter feed's going to be gone without me. And that's just not taking advantage of, of uh, what this digital age could be about. Now, you just finished uh, writing a book. It takes a long time. And when we talked uh, three years ago at South by Southwest, you were expressing some 
uh, pondering as to is the role of the book uh, diminishing as kind of the center of our cultural media creation, kind of going the way of opera and the epic poem as nice things, but not really suitable. Uh, fresh off your experience of writing another book, uh, what's your sense of how central it is to, to the culture? Well, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I do know that I can write one 800-word CNN piece, and if it has a flashy headline or some controversial kind of thing, more people will read that piece than have read all my books combined. And, I mean, I guess that's a good thing, but it's also a discouraging thing. You know, it's like, or I go on like Colbert, right? More people see me on one Colbert episode than have read everything I've ever written combined, right? And it's like, wow. So, you know, why am I here kind of singing an opera when the people are watching, you know, Netflix? Uh, you know, I guess partly because um, there's certain kinds of things that can be said in a book that can't be said in small forms. Most people aren't saying it with books. I mean, and, and the temptation with books now is to use them as calling cards, to write this sort of book where the whole thing is in the introduction, then you just repeat it in a bunch of different ways uh, for the rest of the book. And I just, I just can't do that. I was raised on Shakespeare and the five-act structure. So I think of a book as a journey and you don't, you know, you don't hit the home run in the book until the fourth batter is up, you know, at the end of the fourth chapter. It's just like, you know, it's where it goes. Um, and, and because I am assuming that when someone buys a book, they are going to take the five or nine hours it takes to actually sit down and read it. But I realize that, that that's anachronistic. And on the other hand, though, it's the only reason to do it. So while I think books are less central, I still think books should be books. And the, the net, if anything, should liberate books to be long-form narrative. Um, and if you understand that and you understand that your readers are voluntary, voluntarily surrendering this big wad of time, then books become mutually subversive and radical. Here we are in an always-on, real-time Twitter society. We're going to take seven hours to read a book, or I'm going to take two years to write a book. And it's not to say, screw all y'all, I'm going in my hole and writing a book, although maybe it is. Um, it's really saying, um, we have time for this. We are allowed. You know, we don't have to, um, you know, we don't have to have sex like bunnies. And we don't have to uh, uh, read read our books like bunnies. We can take our time into things that matter. The object of the game is not to take up more time. It's to create more time, right? Create more time for what, right? So here we are. You know, we're, we're spending 99% of our time trying to make ourselves more efficient, you know, and that leaves 1% for the stuff that we're supposed to be efficient for. Um, and I'm finding that the, the, the goals of efficiency themselves, these are the leftover goals of the industrial age. That's what made sense for the assembly line. That's what made sense for colonial empires that were trying to expand. That's what makes sense for central currency that's being lent at interest over time to pay back to make banks rich. It doesn't make sense in a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer maker craft-like 21st century that we're moving into. Have you sent Colbert an email to let him know you're available to talk about the latest book? Oh, I did. Where I sent his people. <laughs> um, yes, they're letting me on. I'll be on May seventh. Uh, Although uh -huh. this is a harder book to talk about. I mean, the other one, the last book, you know, it was about corporatism, and I could just get on and say, I knew he was going to say, "What's your beef with corporations?" Which is what he said, right? Yeah. Why do you hate the corporation? What don't you like about McDonald? So I had my my first line was. Um, I don't have a problem with corporations. What I, my problem is that you know our whole we're we're living our whole world. You know we're turning our world into a corporation. And when you do that, you know you stop looking at the land as something to shepherd. You stop doing this. You you know. So I had a list. It's like in present shock, it's a harder um, concept to wrap into something easy for Stephen to riff off. Then is the other thing. So I've got little examples. I'm I'm going to bring in. I, I, usually, what I'll do before I go on a show like that. It's funny. It's front loaded, right? So I will spend. I'll, I have two days blocked off on the calendar before I go, where those two days are for me to sit alone and practice, right, and rehearse. Why? Because if more people are going to see that six minutes, then 
will read before and after it everything I've ever, ever written, then that's a high leverage point. That's something that I'd be a fool not to prepare for.